Now that we actually talked about, about the difference between DNA and RNA, and we talked about the different kinds of RNA, and we talked about the difference between protein and DNA's roles in the cell, and we also understand how the genetic code actually works, looks like, you can kind of know where we're going with this protein to synthesis thing. DNA gets transcribed to RNA, which gets transcribed to protein in accordance to the, the phenomena of the codon table. But what cellular process actually makes this happen? That's protein synthesis, and it actually happens in several stages. It all starts with transcription, which is the process by which DNA code gets transcribed or into RNA code by using base pairing rules in an enzyme called RNA polymerase. Then, if you're in a eukaryotic cell, and in eukaryotic cells only, prokaryotic cells do not do this, the RNA needs to be processed in what's called a post-transcription uh, RNA processing. And then the RNA it will exit the nucleus through the nuclear pores and find a ribosome, or rather a ribosome will find it, and will attach to it, and then the prosynthesis process will start in something that's called translation, where the genetic message stored in RNA is translated into a different kind of structure, which is no longer nucleic acid, that's why it's called translation, different kind of molecule, this time a polypeptide or protein. Now, especially in eukaryotes, after this is completed, you still have post-translation and modification of proteins, which is going to involve a lot of things. So these are the stages of the protein synthesis process, which will happen from the nucleus to the cytoplasm and beyond. By the way, is the actors of this stage or the players are going to be the DNA, which needs to be transcribed, the messenger RNA, which is, has first the primary message, and then it has processing to the final mature RNA. Then it exits through the nuclear pores, finds a ribosome, which is made of RNA and protein, and by the way, enzymes are going to be involved in all of this process. Then a transfer RNA is going to actually attach itself to the ribosome RNA, carrying the correct amino acids to put in the sequence of, with the protein. And then through that process and the action of a lot of other helper proteins and enzymes, you're actually going to make the protein. And then after that, another set of enzymes and even organelles such as the Golgi apparatus and the rough in the plasma reticulum will do the job of post-translational modification of the proteins. Now let's actually talk about how this happens, starting with transcription. Transcription is the process by which DNA becomes RNA. And this is done with the help of an enzyme called RNA polymerase. There are several different kinds of RNA polymerase, actually. What, type 1 is basically in charge of making ribosomal RNA. Type 2 will make precursor mRNA, or the actual or genetic message which calls for proteins, as well as small nuclear RNAs and microRNAs. We'll talk about what those things are later. RNA polymerase type 3 will make ribosomal RNA of a special type, the 5S ribosomal RNA, and you also make a lot of the transfer RNAs and other types of small RNA products. And you have different classes of this kind of RNA polymerase, respectively class 1, 2, and 3 for the roles which are described above. Finally, you have RNA polymerase type 4, which is in charge of making small interfering RNA, which has everything to do with gene expression control, and we'll talk about that in the next chapter. But the one that's most important is going to be the RNA polymerase type 2, which is going to be the one that's actually going to be coming, making those coding RNA sequences, or the messenger RNA that's going to be becoming a protein. But basically, the way that any RNA polymerase works is that it will do what topozomerase, helicase, and DNA polymerase do during DNA synthesis, and it will uncoil, unzip, and then copy the DNA code, except that it will create a hybrid between the actual DNA and RNA code. It will travel through the DNA and create what is called a transcription bubble. And you'll notice that it will only work in one strand of the DNA, creating a copy of the, that strand into actual RNA. Notice that the strand that's inside the actual RNA polymerase, it's called the actual template strand, and the strand that's on the outside is called the non-template strand. And after the RNA polymerase travels through a segment, it will actually create a hybrid of RNA and DNA that eventually disconnects and forms the RNA that ends up exiting the RNA polymerase. And behind it, the DNA will zip up back up and rewind back to normal. 
Now, this RNA polymerase will copy only the template strand like we said, and it will read the DNA code downstream from the three end of the DNA towards the five end of the DNA. So they'll read in a three to five direction, and that means it will create the RNA in a five to three direction, just like DNA polymerase does when making DNA synthesis. And notice that by translating the template strand, what you actually end up getting is something that looks similar to the non-template strand. Check it out. In this example, you start the RNA that's based on the template strand with a C and then it's going to be A, U, C, C and A. And this is happening because it's, like we talked about in the coding, it's actually doing the opposite of the base pairing rule as expected. So T gets translated into A, A gets translated into U. Remember that U is what you use in RNA because it's more stable if it's going to be unpaired. G becomes C and T becomes A and so forth. Now, if you actually pay attention to the non-template strand, you will see that the sequence in the non-template strand closely matches the sequence on the RNA that's growing. Check it out. C, A, T, C, C, A, A, and T, when you're ever going to put the U. It's exactly the very same sequence that is going to be in the RNA, which leads to the point of the following question. When RNA polymerase is copying the DNA code into the RNA code, it's actually getting the code of the non-template strand. Because the coding strand, or the strand that actually has the sense, the, or actually has the message, which represents the protein, is the strand that's not read by the RNA polymerase. And the strand that's actually the temporary strand, or the bottom strand, is the anti-sense, or the opposite of what you actually want. What sense does it make to do it that way? Well, think about it. Based on pairing rules, if you actually transcribe the top, what you get is something that looks like the bottom strand over here, because that's basically what happens when the DNA is being synthesized. But that is the wrong code. That's the wrong sequence to make the protein. I want AUG, not UAC. And so, not UAC. And so, if I want the message to be AUG, I can't copy the strand that actually has that message. I have to copy the opposite strand so that when I go backwards, I get the message that I want. I know this is kind of confusing, but remember this. The template strand doesn't have the code that you want. It has the anti-code that you want. The non-template strand or the templates or the strand that's not inside the RNA polymerase, the one that's not red, is the one that actually makes sense, that it has the code that represents the protein. So if you pick up a piece of DNA, you have to look at the non-template strand to see what is the RNA code that actually represents the codon message that's going to be translated into protein. The process of creating RNA from a DNA molecule has everything to do with the base pairing rules that Shagraf talked about, but remember, you all Always substitute U for T when you're actually writing an RNA molecule. Also remember, like we talked about in the DNA coding video, that it's very important to maintain the reading frame. If you actually start from the wrong place, the whole thing gets messed up, as this example that we talked about before. And so, there's going to be a specific structure to the gene to allow this to happen. Remember that the RNA polymerase will read the code in a 3 to 5 direction of the template strand to actually build an RNA in a 5 to 3 direction that matches the code in the non-template strand or the actual sense strand. And the completed RNA transcript is going to look very similar to that. Now transcription will actually happen in three stages. It will have first you're going to have to activate a transcription unit, we're going to talk about what that is in a second, by actually activating what is called a promoter sequence. Then you initiate transcription by actually allowing the RNA polymerase to attach itself to the DNA and unwind it. Then the RNA will elongate as the RNA polymerase reads through the code. And finally, as the RNA polymerase reads, reaches the end of the gene, it will terminate and release from the DNA and let out the completed RNA transcript, which in eukaryotes still needs to be processed. Let's look at each one of these things in detail, starting with analyzing this basic structure of a gene. So, a gene actually includes areas which are not transcribed. We call these areas the non-coding regions of the, of the gene. And 
the most important of these non-coding regions is actually called the promoter sequence or the regulator sequence. This regulator region actually makes sure that the DNA is going to be read. Only the piece of DNA that you want to be read is actually read. The other ones are inactivated or coiled up in a way that you, the RNA polymerase cannot attach itself to and therefore not copying it. Think about it. I only want to make a certain kind of protein if that protein is needed for the cell. But how does the cell know that that protein is needed? Chemical messages for the cytoplasm of the cell reach the nucleus, and we call this chemical message transcription factors. These transcription factors will attach themselves to the regulatory region of the gene, or upstream from the actual transcription unit. And then this regulatory region, when the transcription factors are attached to it, will become activated. This regulatory region is also called a promoter box. Now, in eukaryotes, a lot of, especially in humans, a lot of these promoter regions are made of, of mostly of adenine and thymine repeated over and over again. And that's a specific region to which RNA polymerase can attach itself to. Now, that is what we call the transcription initiation sequence. And this also called the Tata box. And when the transcription factors are attached to the DNA molecule, in other words, the cell is receiving a message from the cytoplasm that it's time to copy whatever gene is after this particular area. And the cool thing is that transcription factors have affinity to that specific promoter box. In other words, they only attach there. So if that's, that chemical is available in the cell, it's going to attach to that piece of the DNA, telling the DNA to copy that gene. And so that's how gene expression is actually regulated. And we'll talk more about this in detail when we're actually doing gene expression control on the next video lecture series. But once those transcription factors are there, it's going to activate the promoter box, which in, in humans are mostly adamine and thymine, repeated over and over again, 25 to 35 base pair longs. And then the RNA polymerase will be able to attach itself and start copying the actual transcription unit. The transcription unit then is going to be composed of the actual area that needs to be copied for the, for the RNA to be successful. And that's going to be downstream from the promoter box all the way to what's called the transcription termination site, which is at the end of the gene. And when you, the RNA polymerase reaches that, it knows it's time to release and terminate the transcription process. And that's how the RNA polymerase knows where to attach, when to attach, and when to release. So that the gene is exactly as long as it needs to be, and it starts exactly where it needs to start, so that the reading frame is not affected. So again, upstream from the actual transcription unit, you're going to have a promoter sequence, which includes... Things like the Tata box, which is something that will attach itself to transcription factors. When those transcription factors actually are there, they activate that, that area. And an RNA polymerase can then attach itself. It's looking for a place to attach. It will attach itself to the DNA. And with the help of those proteins, will start the process of actually copying the transcription unit, which is going to be downstream from that promoter of the regulatory region of the gene. And we'll talk about how that actually works when we do gene expression control. When you look at the actual transcription unit, though, the actual air piece that gets, gets, actually gets copied, you actually see that it has a lot more than you would expect. First, it will have a sequence to create what is called the GCAP. And we'll talk about what that is when we do RNA processing. After that, it has a short sequence of untranslated DNA. That's a piece that's just not actually translated by the ribosomes, but it helps determine where does the ribosome need to go, and it also helps preserve the, the, the RNA over a long period of time. Even if the GCAP is missing, it's still going to preserve the DNA and protect it from degradation, kind of like the telomeres do to the actual DNA code. That little untranslated region protects the message that is actually there. Then you're going to hit the start codon, and from the start codon into the, to the stop codon, you're going to have a lot of information there, or all of the codons which actually determine the proteins that you actually want to do. But we, in between those codons, which are useful, you have also going to have a bunch of junk, which is called introns. And we'll talk about what those introns are and what they do in the next video when we do RNA processing. Then you're going to get to the stop codon. At the end of the stop codon, you're going to get another big region of untranslated DNA, again, to protect the actual message from degradation. Even if the beginning or the end gets destroyed, the message remains intact. 
then you're going to have the poly A tail, which is another layer of protection to actually make sure that the DNA, the, the RNA doesn't get destroyed. By the way, genes that need to be expressed longer have usually have longer non-coding regions upstream and downstream from the actual coding sequence to make sure they survive longer and therefore make proteins for a longer period of time. So that's the process of transcription or the process by which our RNA polymerase converts the message from DNA to RNA from after it attaches to the promoter sequence and works through the whole thing all the way until it reaches the transcription termination site. On the next video, we're going to talk about how RNA is processed.